uh, welcome. Ah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our last Blue Bag Lunch Talk of the semester. My name is Christy Baer, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director of the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy at the University of Michigan. I am thrilled that you are joining us for this. The end of the semester is always hard, and so we are truly grateful that you are taking time to spend with us. Um, the purpose of these Blue Bag Lunch Talks is to foster interdisciplinary collaborations across schools. The University of, is, the University of Michigan is unique in that it's not just one really good school with a cup with a so-so uh, bench. Um, the University of Michigan is a collection of top ranked schools uh, across the 19 schools and colleges. And one of the beautiful things about being here is that every sidewalk leads to a top program with people who are committed to doing research in pursuit of the public good. So um, we open these talks to everyone in the hopes that it helps you find new collaborators, that it helps the um, faculty to present their ideas, have them stress test by people who are also brilliant but trained to think a little bit differently. So um, the way that this is going to work is that Professor Schaefer is going to um, talk for a little bit and we are asking you to keep yourself muted while he's talking. And then um, as you have questions, you can either send them in the chat by just posting question. And then at the end, I'll give you a chance to unmute and ask the question yourself. Or um, if you want me to ask your question for you, totally happy to do it. Just say, ask for me and I won't identify you. So um, without further delay, um, I want to thank Liz Smith and Tracy Van Dusen, who uh, will be behind this the whole time, making sure that the tech works. And now let me tell you a little bit about Luke Schaefer. Luke Schaefer is the Herman and Amelie Cohn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy. He's also the Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement at the Ford School of Public Policy. At U of M, he is a professor of social work and he's the inaugural director of Poverty Solutions. If you're not familiar, Poverty Solutions is an interdisciplinary initiative. Uh, it's a research center that's focused on finding new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. So through that role, um, Associate Dean Schaefer acts as a special counselor on anti-poverty policy to the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. He's published a bunch of stuff, Poverty Solutions tries all kinds of experimental and interesting things to see what works and what doesn't. And if you have not read his award-winning book, $2 a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America, then I would highly recommend that you put that on your winter reading list because it is fascinating and um, it reads almost like a novel. So two thumbs up for that one. His topic today is Journey to a Fully Refundable Child Tax Credit in the United States, a child allowance to some, tax relief for middle class families to others, and anti-poverty pover policy by another name to me. We've posted a related paper and a Wall Street Journal um, article to give you a little bit of context, but if you didn't read them in advance, don't worry about it because he is going to tell you all about it. And if there is anyone who can make tax policy uh, come to life and be actually interesting, I think we've found the right guy. So Associate Dean Schaefer, thanks for joining us today. Christy, thanks. I appreciate it. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said about me. So uh, I will try to make tax policy interesting. And this is a, I mean, I find it very interesting uh, in that it is tax policy, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's uh, social welfare policy. Maybe it's family policy. So let's see where we get by the end of the day. And maybe really it doesn't matter what each of us think about it or not. So uh, Poverty Solutions is the initiative I run. We are a university-wide initiative, but we sit at the Ford School. We get to, um, you know, uh, when we're in, in residence, we share an actual hallway with Christy and the, the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy. So now we'll just sort of deem that we're sharing a virtual hallway. 
And uh, she described what we try to do. We try to partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. Uh, looking at a range of things. We're very active in the city of Detroit. We have a partnership on economic mobility uh, with uh, Mayor Duggan and his team. And we work on all sorts of things like digital inclusion. Uh, the digital inclusion director for the city of Detroit um, actually works for me at Poverty Solutions, but spends his time uh, at the city and um, heads up those initiatives for the city. Uh, he just did a commercial on digital inclusion with Aquaman, the actor in the blockbuster video. So, um, uh, and uh, within a day it had like 900,000 views. So now I'm only doing videos with uh, mega super, um, you know, superstars. Um, and we do a lot with the state of Michigan too. Uh, so I serve as a special counselor to MDHHS. Uh, we have a team that works with the department on public assistance programs. Uh, and of course, many other faculty at the University of Michigan that do a lot on health policy. So we were very active uh, during, have been very active during the COVID crisis in terms of trying to make our public assistance programs work as good as possible during this time. So today I'm talking about sort of a solution that I've been thinking about for a really long time, um, I guess, relatively speaking. And it really does come out of my book, $2 a day. So I came into uh, my career as a scholar, uh, really focusing on large scale data. I'd actually done a fair amount of um, social work in terms of case management uh, before that, but uh, really got interested in sort of the structural reasons for poverty and uh, came to University of Michigan. I was studying programs like unemployment insurance. That's a program that uh, historically low-wage workers have a lot of difficulty accessing. And actually one of the, the most novel things that we've ever done in social policy was in the CARES Act when we really expanded unemployment insurance to um, a huge amount of the workforce that isn't covered by that program that are in non-traditional jobs that are working on 1099s, whether legally they should or not. And a lot of, of the reason why people get sort of moved to those is to avoid benefit costs, including employer taxes on unemployment insurance. Uh, but historically, uh, um, for example, black workers, they're less likely, they're both less likely to apply for unemployment insurance and uh, they're less likely to get it if they do apply. But the folks that don't apply actually often um, are uncertain as to sort of what the actual rules are that would keep them from accessing it, but just know that it's not you know, terribly accessible. Then you have a program like SNAP, that Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, what a lot of people call, um, you know, historically it's called food stamps. And uh, that's sort of an in-kind benefit, right? And so scholars really debate about whether or not it's money or is it food assistance. And you can see uh, that when people have other money coming in, that uh, if you give a benefit like food assistance, that people can take some of the money they were spending on food and apply it to other stuff. It kind of works like cash. But in uh, my work on $2 a day, I really sort of moved out of my sort of shell, the safety of being a data nerd and spending most of my career looking at large scale data. Um, I love data, you know, a great chart or a spreadsheet just makes me feel really warm inside and I cuddle it up at night, but my, my wife is adamant, no data in the bed. Um, and uh, so in this project though, I sort of uh, did more of a mixed methods. We sort of did this different technology of actually saying, you know what, if I have questions about extreme poverty in the United States, uh, maybe I should go out and talk to people. So I paired up with Kathy Eden, who is now at Princeton. Uh, she was at Harvard when we started and then she was at Hopkins and now she's at Princeton. And uh, we tried to marry both things. And what we were really interested in was families who um, often had access to food assistance through SNAP. Some maybe had a housing subsidy, but families who had no access to cash that had no access to money. And uh, you can see in virtually every data set available, household survey data sets. Um, I think we can, we've seen the trend in at least four different major household survey data sets. You can see it in administrative records of people on SNAP who are reporting they don't have any money. Um, you see this big spike in the number of families that are going a month, a calendar quarter or an entire year with extremely low uh, cash incomes. And, 
so really one of the major questions in the book was, um, you know, what is that experience like? Uh, what is it like in uh, 21st century America to not have any money? And uh, do the in-kind benefits that we do offer that are more widely available, do they make up for that or not? And in doing the work of getting to know families in Chicago and Cleveland and uh, Appalachia and then down to the Mississippi Delta, one of the really striking things that uh, we found very early on that I think is a partial answer to that very question is how much time people actually spent uh, trying to generate a little bit of cash, right? Even if they had these uh, in-kind benefits, how much time was spent trying to get that enough money to buy toilet paper or uh, toothbrushes or um, new clothes for the kids uh, at the secondhand store and uh, really the very innovative ways that they would go about um, doing that. And it was really, I think, elucidated to me uh, the degree to which um, all the work I'd been done doing before, which I, uh, you know, I still think I did really good work before I was uh, um, doing mixed method work. I mean, maybe it wasn't really good work, but it was, it was fine. It was pretty good, right? Uh, I was proud of it. How's that? And uh, other people can determine whether or not it's any good. But um, I guess what I, you know, really came to appreciate is how much like my positionality as a researcher, you know, often doing my work, looking at a data set in my office, either at Staten Hill or South or East U, and, you know, getting frustrated and going down, getting a coffee, like how much I often didn't even know the right questions to ask and things that I missed. So one example of that is uh, the important role of blood plasma, right? So when we think about uh, Americans who uh, don't have enough money, they don't have enough money in a week or they don't have enough money uh, in a month, um, what is one coping mechanism for that? Um, we found in three of our four field sites that uh, selling uh, blood plasma was ubiquitous, right? So uh, it turns out um, if you go to most places, Christy and I were talking about this before, if you go to most places, um, uh, very poor, usually urban uh, zip codes or census tracts, uh, that's usually where you'll find a plasma center. And they're usually off of a bus line. They're often like located actually right next to the um, public benefits office. And uh, people will come in. And uh, in, the, in the case of Jessica Compton, she, uh, her husband actually had been working in a, uh, a fast food restaurant. And he'd sort of seen this thing that's pretty common where he still had a job, but his hours had been cut to zero after uh, the holidays. And you see a lot of variation in hours. It creates a lot of instability. And, you know, scholars are really starting to think that instability actually might be worse, right? Or at least its own issue on top of um, the experience of low income in general. So there was no money for a number of months coming into their family, except for the money that Jessica made selling her blood plasma. So they would use a little bit of her SNAP benefit to buy an iron rich sort of breakfast bar because you have to sort of uh, pass these tests. And if you're, you know, you might be anemic, then you can't sell your plasma. Uh, she would check out a book at the library so that she could be reading because that could help her sort of keep herself calm. Because uh, the only thing worse than having to sell your blood plasma um, to make ends meet is uh, not being able to sell your blood plasma to make ends meet. And uh, she would go, you know, with the kids. Uh, her husband had gotten a couple of tattoos um, and because of the circumstances was sort of deemed that he couldn't sell his plasma. So she was sort of the breadwinner, if you will. And they would go and um, she would answer all the questions, um, sit on the table. It took her a little longer than a typical person um, because she was small. And then she would get a bank card, actually. They used to often give cash, but now um, the plasma companies actually have deals with um, uh, banks where it, it goes on like a debit card. Of course, then there's like fees associated with that debit card that nobody really knows like how much then is the bank actually capturing um, the benefit of that. And, you know, we actually learned about this first because one of the first women we met uh, had a scar on the inside of her uh, crease of her elbow. And, uh, you know, uh, we learned that that was actually a 
a scar from selling blood plasma so often. So that got me interested in going back to the data sort of in this iterative mixed methods process. And uh, we decided to say, oh, what, we're seeing all these people are selling their blood plasma. Um, what to make of that? Has there been any sort of increase in the country? And it turns out, you know, one, one nice thing is that the Plasma Trade Association is actually, I think you can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen, Christy? Yep, all right. Uh, the Trade Association is actually quite proud of the fact that um, blood plasma sales actually, if we added 2019, they've more than quadrupled in about the last uh, 12 years. Uh, we were uh, pretty routinely at about 10 million plasma sales, you know, in the mid 2000s, and we've since sort of skyrocketed up and we're now up over 50 million plasma sales uh, in 2019. So there has been like this huge increase in plasma sales. And then it actually turns out that um, uh, the American plasma supply accounts for like 70% of the world market in plasma. And Americans only consume about 40%. So, you know, export is not exactly the right word, but, you know, in effect, we actually export the blood plasma of poor Americans all around the world. And uh, you, the United States is the only place where you can sell your blood plasma twice in one week. Um, every other sort of Western industrialized country says uh, the health risks are too great, although we don't know a ton about that. And, and then it turns out actually the plasma industry is incredibly profitable, right? Where um, uh, it turns out every major plasma supplier is a Fortune 500 company. Uh, they've done quite well. There's a lot of sort of investors that are usual suspect type names that are involved. So, you know, this sort of opened up a whole new world in a lot of ways, right? And I think sort of a benefit of both bringing data and you know, bringing data as well as um, actual connection uh, to the puzzle. So when our book came out, we wrote about plasma. Um, we got a sternly worded letter from the International Plasma Trade Association saying, it's fine for you to talk about poverty, but could you please mention that plasma is an important component in a lot of life-saving health treatments? So plasma is an important component in a lot of life-saving health treatments. Um, but to me, there are a number of questions, right? So um, exploitation is something that I think at least sort of merits some conversation, right? To understand like is what's happening when you have sort of a globally profitable industry that is built um, totally on like the blood of poor Americans. We're not even talking about like figuratively, right? Um, that's something uh, that maybe we should talk about and what the implications are. And some people think maybe we should outlaw paid plasma donation. To me, um, I know what Jessica's other options are, right, for generating that kind of money. And I don't think any of them, I think in, all, in some cases you might argue this is the safest one. So another sort of option is to traffic your food stamps. So uh, we don't think this happens a lot overall, but among people who don't have any other source of money, so they can't do that sort of substitution, we think it happens a lot. And it might take the form of going to uh, a grocery store that you know does this sort of thing, and you buy $100 of fake groceries, and you get $60 back. Now that's like the exchange rate. It's actually pretty uh, striking how consistent the exchange rates are across place. They, um, it looks to me like the more SNAP dollars there are in a community, actually, you can see the exchange rate sort of adjust, where in Chicago and Cleveland, we'd see 60 cents on the dollar. Uh, in the Mississippi Delta, we'd see like 40 cents on the dollar, um, because like the number of people who sort of fit the criteria of our book down there is just much higher than anywhere else. Um, and uh, so it's a great sort of question, right? Do we, would we rather people selling their blood plasma? Um, or trafficking their SNAP. Um, selling your blood plasma is legal, but it's actually extractive, you know, extractive. Uh, selling your SNAP uh, won't impact your health directly, although it means you're gonna have less food, right? Uh, and less other things. And, um, and it also is actually uh, very illegal in a way. So in most SNAP applications, if you look down at the footer, you'll see, um, 
you know, it'll say, you know, if you get caught trafficking your SNAP, that's sort of what I just described as trafficking your SNAP, you could face up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Um, so by the letter of the law, when you're sort of filling out your SNAP application, uh, it would look like the penalty for selling your SNAP is actually uh, quite a bit larger than robbing a bank. So we looked into it and sort of the sentencing guidelines for robbing a bank is about five years. So I don't know that anyone's ever received um, 20 years, but that's sort of what we ask people to understand about um, the penalty and uh, where we hold it. One other thing, right? So as getting to know families without any money, right? Being struck by how much money, how much time they actually spend working, right? They're not in a job, but how much time they spend some people do think of selling their blood plasma as their job. And some people actually, you know, create um, like a little um, store uh, with their SNAP dollars, right? So we've seen sort of uh, a living room store where people buy uh, food with their SNAP and then it's like a candy store or something for local kids. And then that's sort of a way to traffic your SNAP too. And some people might say like innovative small business and other people, you know, by the letter of the law, this is, um, a felony. Uh, the other thing that really sort of struck me about this work is how much um, we often don't know what people actually need, right? So, um, you know, we might not know about this whole world of blood plasma. Uh, we often, as sort of scholars and because of positionality, we don't know really what they would use resources for, right? So when we do so much work, so much of anti-poverty stuff in kind, uh, we take away the autonomy of people to sort of put the money where they need it the most. So uh, in this case, I'm thinking about my work in Detroit. So uh, we've spent a couple of years now working with uh, community organizations, working with the mayor. Um, and if you had asked me when I came in, like what are the biggest sort of costs that Detroiters face, right? The, the biggest things that sort of keep them from uh, living the, the uh, healthy and productive lives that they want to live. Uh, nowhere on the top 10, maybe not the top 100, would have been auto insurance. But uh, we came to see like over and over again that this was a, something that everybody was talking about. And when you go back to the data, you can see why. So um, let's see. there we go. So this is from the Zebra. It's a national sort of auto insurance comparison company. And you can see sort of nationwide, if we're comparing the same insurance policy, the average annual cost of car insurance nationwide would be about $900. That's about 2% of income. That's at a threshold the US Treasury says is um, reasonable, right? That's affordable if it's under 2%. In Ann Arbor, uh, that same policy, the Zebra estimates would be $2,100. I actually just renewed my policy and um, that's, that's about right. The same policy in Detroit uh, was estimated to be $5,700, right? And that's 20% of the annual income of someone. So um, we're asking Detroiters to spend 20% of their entire annual income on auto insurance. That's like, crazy, right? Like if, if your housing is 30% of your income, we call that unaffordable. So where does auto insurance sort of fit into that? And it's not because Detroit's a city and they have more accidents because in Cleveland, that same policy is $1,600. So the point is like, uh, if I were creating sort of these means tested programs, I don't always know what it is that people need the most, right? So this is, this took me down a few paths. The, the first is that in thinking about what we do for um, low-income Americans, right, um, members of society, uh, that maybe cash is the better way to do it, right? So uh, I think this sort of drives the UBI uh, debate. Um, by providing cash, we sort of create that autonomy, right? We um, uh, uh, sort of empower people to know what it is uh, that are the things that they need um, and do those, right? And, and sort of spend on those versus making decisions for them um, and then creating a little bit of sort of inefficiency in the system, right? So 
when people have to sell their SNAP for money because they need that little bit of money, uh, they lose maybe 40% of the purchasing power. A couple of other things from that work, right? A set of principles that um, I came to uh, is um, that you people need some amount of assistance at regular intervals, right? So I talked about those um, wage swings, right? Where Travis Compton, he's working, he's sort of part of the working poor at the end of the year and at the beginning of the year, now he's uh, part of the extreme poor, right? And trying to understand that like people's lives don't really relate to that average income over that whole amount of time. Uh, they relate to the fact that um, they have these huge swings. And uh, there's some great work by uh, Jonathan Mordock and colleagues, um, Rachel Schneider, I think, called the Financial Diaries Project that shows like people's uh, really these swings, right? Where you might go 60 or 80% above or below your overall median, they're the norm rather than the exception among low-income Americans. Another thing that I sort of thought a lot about was maybe simpler is better, right? So uh, as policy wonks, when we're thinking about like, how do we intervene, right? So for me, I'm trying to think, how do we intervene for very low-income families? Um, I think as, as policy wonks, we like to add that next sort of notch, right? Or we like to think about what, uh, where things should change and complicate and try to solve all of our problems by over complicating policy. And um, sometimes that helps, and but sometimes it uh, makes it more difficult, right? Or uh, people, this is sort of a very libertarian, I think, argument of saying like people, um, well, whether it be em employers or whether it be um, people receiving benefits or, you know, people that they're interacting with, they, they know how to sort of get around those notches. So maybe it's better to uh, be as simple as possible rather than uh, complicate things more. Uh, by being as simple as possible, that gets you into sort of an age old debate, right? Of universal versus targeted. So if we wanna tackle poverty in the United States, our general approach has always been to be very targeted, to say, we only wanna give money to people who are like below the line by which they need help. We really don't wanna give people money who are above that line. And um, the good impulse in that is saying like, we really want the money to go to the people that need it. Uh, the bad impulse is that you sort of spend a lot of time thinking about who the people are who are going to try to cheat in, right, and the stigma of the welfare queen and sort of um, the extreme racial dimension of that, right, where uh, we're sort of problematizing individuals uh, based on maybe a couple of examples or maybe just based on myth. Um, and the impact is that it means all of our systems, having worked in state government, sort of are geared towards keeping people who don't deserve benefits from getting them, rather than making sure people who are eligible for benefits receive the ones that they're eligible for, right? When you go to a universal system, you spend more money, right? So by saying, you know what, we're just gonna give the exact same amount to everyone, or maybe not everyone, but maybe like all low and middle income families. And uh, if you uh, do that, right, then you don't have certain segments of the population that's like, it's not fair that they get something that I don't. And, uh, and then also you sort of don't have to do the work of saying who deserves it and who doesn't, right? Because everybody gets the same thing and this creates a sort of simplicity. It's possible that in that simplicity, we find ourselves in a much more equitable environment. Right? So in our current means tested system that really tries to target need, you would think uh, that groups who disproportionately are impacted by poverty, uh, people of color, Black Americans in particular, right, who sort of um, uh, have to deal with all of these different sort of layers of uh, structural racism across the board, that they might sort of uh, disproportionately be able to access those benefits. But with our refundable tax credit policy, because right now the programs we have are all tied to earnings, it actually means that um, poor children who are black, their families get less than poor children who are white. 
So the current child tax credit is one where you have to have $3,000 of earnings before you start to accrue your child tax credit. And then with every dollar you earn, you accrue more benefits. And that means that about a third of all children are in families who don't earn enough to get that full child tax credit benefit. And half of children who are black are in families who don't get the full credit. That's not equitable at all, right? That to me, if we're thinking of this as poverty policy, that doesn't make any sense. And, and so you could sort of take an approach of saying, you know what, let's just sort of shift that whole register down um, and make it sort of more of a means-tested program. Or you could say, let's give to children who are struggling the most the same thing that we give to middle class and sort of upper middle class kids as well. And that sort of takes a universal approach. So it's more expensive, of course, um, but it's maybe also more politically stable over time. And by treating everyone the same, we make sure that we don't sort of disproportionately treat children, sort of um, children who uh, have the most to overcome, treat them uh, not the same, right? That we, we give them less. All right. So I've done, a, I spent almost all of my time on the run up, but let me tell you sort of how this gets me to a child allowance. So it turns out a child allowance is a type of policy where um, mo many other Western industrialized countries say, hey, raising kids is expensive. And as a society, we have a reason to make sure that it's done well. And uh, Canada actually has a, has a benefit and they've been so happy with it, they've expanded it a number of times. And as they expanded it, they saw child poverty fall by about 30%. So this has the benefit of being, this is a, you know, a universal or a near universal policy where we just say, every family who's raising kids deserves some help from the government to make sure they have the resources to do that as well as possible. And um, the most effective way to give those resources is in cash. And, in terms of like dealing with that intra-year instability, the best way to do that is cash in regular intervals. So all of those sort of principles sum up to something very simple, which is just to say, what if we gave every family with kids $250 per child per month for a year? Maybe we do more for little kids because it turns out those little kids are really expensive, right? Um, and uh, maybe we phase it out at the very top. Um, and what would that do? How would that change things? Well, uh, the paper that I sent you uh, sort of focuses on what I care about, right? Uh, which is poverty reductions. So this is, let's see if I can share it. This is estimates using current population survey data. This is our, these data are not very good, but uh, there are official poverty um, estimates. And you can see um, right now, so I think these are probably 2016 numbers, uh, according to the uh, child supplemental poverty measure, uh, which is sort of like the full accounting of income possible, about 16.7% of kids fall below this poverty threshold. Um, if we implemented $250 a month, a $250 a month uh, child allowance, that would fall to 9.6%, right? So that's like 35, 40% poverty reduction. The number of kids that are below half of the poverty line, right? So not at like an income of like $25,000 a year or less, but at like $12,000 a year after you account for everything would go from about 4.3% of kids to 2.1%. And so that's cutting it about half. And then the number of families who are like extreme low cash income, right? The ones who motivated my book, there's about, if you look annually, it's about 1.5% of of kids and, and we think it's about 4% of kids who experience spells over the course of the year. But we essentially wipe that away, right? So this simple policy of just saying, everybody deserves a little bit of money because government has a reason to make sure children have the resources they need to be successful, means that we would just like make my book a historical artifact, right? There wouldn't be anybody, essentially anybody below that line. And uh, this would be, uh, would cost us to the tune of uh, looking at that 200 universal $250 a month option. It, uh, if we fold in the current child tax credit, which as I mentioned, sort of disproportionately goes to higher income kids, 
we're looking at a sort of a net cost around $90 billion. So um, at one point, $90 billion was sort of like a lot of money, right? And uh, it's been interesting to watch the progression of this. So I'm gonna just tell you the political story and then I'm gonna close out. Um, so I think I'm, I'm gonna be pretty close, Christy, to uh, the time allotment you gave me. She's not looking at her watch just yet. So um, we published the paper, which some of you may have read, and um, had a conference, the Brookings, Insta, um, Brookings did a conference for us. We all got together. And then I went in for full professor a couple of years ago and uh, got the comments back. I, I did get promoted, and, uh, but uh, I always remember sort of one comment in there, uh, the child allowance paper was one of the papers I included. And one of the reviewers said, I guess it's fine for uh, Professor Schaefer and his colleagues to think about policy proposals that never have any chance at all of becoming law, right? That are basically pipe dreams. And right about the time when he wrote that, um, some, um, Senators, U.S. Senators Michael Bennett and Sherrod Brown, they introduced a bill called the American Family Act that was essentially identical to our proposal, right? Just say in $250, it sort of phases out at income above 100,000, paid out monthly um, and fully refundable. That's the important thing of saying, even families without it, tax liability can get it if they file. And you know when they when they introduced it, it had a handful of sponsors. I would definitely say it was in pipe dream territory. But over the last couple of years, virtually every Democratic senator has signed on. So I think we had 48 or 49 uh, Democratic senators, um, 180, 190 members in the House. Uh, it was this proposal, two years of funding for this proposal was included in the HEROES Act, which was uh, passed through the House of Representatives in, um, uh, as like their next thing that they wanted to do in COVID response, understanding like families are in the double, triple or quadruple bind right now, families with kids compared to everyone else. And in the first CARES Act, we did almost nothing extra for them. In fact, you know, the EIP, the Economic Incentive Payment counted kids at like 40% of adults. Uh, mm, President-elect Biden included this measure in his proposed sort of economic uh, budget plan, about two years of funding. And then recently Mitt Romney uh, identified it as sort of the number one thing where he would see bipartisan, the possibility of bipartisan collaboration. So. My um, scholarly response to the reviewer uh, who said this could never be possible um, is suck it. Um, now, Romney's really interesting, right? Because uh, Romney, um, let's see, uh, I think Portman also from uh, Ohio. And then uh, it looks like Marco Rubio is actually very interested in this idea, idea and Mike Lee. So that starts to get you to numbers where you could actually see it passing. And importantly, because again, it's tax policy, it uh, only requires a majority vote in the Senate. So it doesn't have to sort of pass a filibuster. And one of the things that's really interesting is, um, you know, when Romney talks about it, um, when Rubio talks about these ideas, it's never about poverty, right? It's, it's all about like families having a hard time sort of making, you know, it's getting too expensive to raise families. And also that so many of our policies actually, they, um, they don't support families who have uh, maybe a stay at home parent. So when we're talking about like universal preschool, right? We're sort of predetermining that that's where kids would go. And so the child allowance has some appeal, right? On that front, because uh, it provides a benefit that sort of as useful to two, two working parent families and families where uh, someone wants to stay home. So like the questions going forward are, uh, to me as I think about the journey, right? Uh, is cash the, the best way to help families? Um, and should we do universal versus targeted policies? And then finally, um, does it matter, right? Uh, does it matter whatsoever if somebody like Mitt Romney has an entirely sort of different set of motivations for doing something like this, right? Do you, is it important to me? I think it's not important 
to me that he recognizes as I think perhaps the best thing we'll have ever done to uh, reduce child poverty and especially the deepest forms of it, uh, as long as he does it. And that sort of leads me to reflect about like how many times like is it a matter of uh, when I'm trying to do policy analysis or I'm trying to uh, do policy advocacy that I'm trying to convince people of a motivation versus sort of figure out what in a policy, if there are policies where completely different motivations get you to the same point. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks for letting me go a little bit long and uh, just love to um, talk about whatever people are interested in. Okay, if you all want, if, um, if folks want to either raise your hand either by uh, using the little icon at the bottom or by unmuting yourself um, or uh, I mean sorry showing your video and then like like this raising your hand that works too um, but I'm gonna go first because I can so you know the thing that I think is so interesting about this is um, how would you even get the money to people though? Mm -hmm. I mean, you still have like 9 million people that didn't even get their um, COVID stimulus payments because so many low-income folks can't, don't have bank accounts. And so um, have you moved that far? I mean, not to minimize how far you have gone so far, but <laughs> it just seems like a huge practical hurdle. I'm curious what thoughts you have about it. Yes, it, uh, it is a practical hurdle, um, but actually not as big as you might think, right? When we're thinking about doing something that would be recurring. So if we're thinking about one of the issues with the EIP is that we never do that sort of thing, right? And so we didn't have any mechanism to do it. And uh, so actually one of the longer term benefits of this is uh, you, you could imagine a scenario uh, it does turn out, right, when we have programs that are meant to send money to people, we're actually pretty good at it, right? So Social Security, you don't, you don't have huge number of seniors who over the long term are like, oh my gosh, they keep sending my Social Security to check to the wrong place. We, we're pretty good at it. Um, and so uh, you could imagine a scenario where like people are given the option to either direct deposit it or to put it on a debit card. So we have 43 million families, um, maybe, yeah, I think we're at about 43 million on SNAP, and they receive all of their benefits through an electronic benefits card. And in fact, like when we started looking at COVID, um, like what could we do in response to COVID, the single easiest thing for us to do was to shoot money to people's EBT cards. And uh, Michigan actually, like, all of the issues with that were actually in like getting the approval when, when we're setting up new things. So like they set up new SNAP benefits for families, but then they were very complicated and we had to get approval from USDA and they took a lot of time, right? The actual sending money to people on those cards, we could do it like in no time at all. So I think the benefit of this is there is some upfront cost, but it's actually something that we have a record of doing well when we put it in place. And then we would create a mechanism by which at least families with kids, we would be able to like shoot the money with none of that costs the next time we have an economic crisis. So um, the problem with the EIP was that we, we don't have any mechanism to do it. So this actually in some, some ways sort of solves the problem for us. Go ahead, Asher. Hey, Asher. Hey. Um, so cool. Um, you're a real hero, honestly. <laughs> um, can you talk about, so the benefit is monthly, um, mm -hmm. but of course, tax returns are annual. Can you talk about situations in which someone may have earned a, quite a bit in six months or for several months and then quite a very little and how that would, um, yeah. would actually operationalize? Great question. So, um, the uh, right now we're in a situation right where we have the earned income tax credit, which is uh, it pays out annually, and we we had a way to do that quarterly, and everyone sort of thinks, oh, nobody wanted it quarterly because they like the forced savings, and in some place that's true, um, 
but also like if you were going to do the quarterly filing, you um, uh, you had to get your employer to sign a lot of paperwork. And then you did sort of run into the issue that you just described, actually, where um, people might actually end up, you know, their circumstances changes over the year and um, they might end up owing money. So uh, the way that we handle that here is uh, the biggest sort of part of the issue is sort of the lower end of the register, right? And um, we want to keep the EITC as it is. Right. There are actually, I, I'm a firm believer that there are benefits of having sort of a lump sum payment, right? So the international evidence is like if you give people a lump sum, they make capital investments. And if you give them an, um, a monthly benefit, they like pay their rent and, and buy food. And, and so we think you actually need both, right? And, and so in actuality, by also having both, we think that we basically mitigate the issue that you just described, right? Where the EITC is actually going up as your earnings go up and then it sort of phases out, right? And the child tax credit goes up, like it, it goes to its top and then stays and then phases out at very, very high incomes. Um, so we think that by sort of doing both, you can do the child allowance monthly and then sort of the EITC register actually sort of saves you from any big bills at the end of the year because that's sort of going up and the stability of the child allowance sort of takes care of that. And then, you know, that's one of the reasons for sort of phasing the child, the child tax credit out at very, very high levels is um, that means sort of you're gonna get up to there before you sort of have any of those sorts of problems. Jatam, then Kevin. Hi, Professor Schaefer. I thoroughly Hi. enjoyed um, your presentation um, and just how you started with um, different things you noticed around plasma and uh, people selling food stamps, EBT. My question for you is, uh, we're in COVID and a lot of people are referring to what's happening with COVID in the recession, a she session, a she session because so many women are having to leave the workforce mm -hmm. um, to support children. So I guess essentially there are a lot of stay at home moms now. Yep. Um, and so I would love to know, how do you see uh, child care allowances as a way to an equitable recovery post COVID? Um, well, I'm, uh, thanks. And uh, I, uh, I feel like I'm, I don't know, I feel like I'm, on all of these questions, I'm sort of think, uh, my answer is I actually think that's why this is a, a good policy in this particular case, right? Because we have so many cases that the child, you know, a child allowance suggests child tax credit, families can use in exactly the ways they see fit, right? So I could imagine a lot of families, you might start using this 250 a month uh, to, you know, 500 if you've got two kids, 750 if you've got three kids to pay for some sort of additional tutoring, right? If you're at home or maybe it's childcare to uh, allow for some of that, you could use it for childcare if you are still, you know, uh, working, um, but you can also use it um, to, you know, pay your transportation costs to get to work or to buy that new computer, right, that's going to allow you to, to do your job at home. So it's really, it's sort of agnostic about what it is um, people should be spending their money on right now. And in that way, I hope that it's responsive to the moment, right, where basically, like, people's lives are heterogeneous. And I don't think we have a totally, there's no like, you know, every family needs this. Uh, it's great that we're doing digital devices, right? And I was really proud that uh, Josh Edmonds, um, my team member was a part of the effort in the city of Detroit to get digital devices um, to every DPSCD kid. On the other hand, a lot of those kids probably had devices, some of them don't but a lot of them did. And so we spent money on them in that way. And so the sort of the, the question, the question on principle and also on like policy efficacy is like, would we have been better um, giving those families money and saying you could use this for a laptop or you can use it for something else, right? Um, so that's the, that's the key is it's sort of, it's got the flexibility um, 
And maybe that means we can't see the impacts in any one sort of domain. That's, I think, a question that we have to, to ask. But, um, and then I think it does sort of, you know, to your point, really, I think like this, this crisis has hit families with kids particularly hard, right? And particularly low income families with kids. Usually if you're losing jobs, you can still depend on schools, right? And both of those things are totally in flux. Um, there's a lot of instability, which we've already talked about is really challenging for people. So I absolutely think that like we should do something specific for families with kids. Um, who are struggling. I know, you know, it's a challenge for me and, and um, financial insecurity is not an issue, right? So um, when we, I was a big advocate with the economic impact payment of saying, you know, why would we count kids as 40% of the cost of adults, right? Maybe that makes sense in some cases, but it certainly doesn't make uh, sense now. So we should absolutely do something for families with kids. And I think because people's challenges are so diverse right now, money is a good way to do it. Kevin, then Tawana. Hi, Dr. Schaefer. Thanks so much for uh, talking with us today. I mean, I think this, this type of proposal would have a huge impact, and it's great to see that there's more political support for it. Um, but it seems like, uh, you know, proposals have more political support when they're targeted to a specific population, you know, the EITC to working people or, or this to, you know, families with children. Um, and I think you've alluded to this in, you know, your presentation and answers to a few of these questions, but um, do you think that there, if there were no political constraints, would it be best to have a true kind of universal anti-poverty system, something like the UBI, or is it really more efficient, um, more fair, you know, whatever to to target programs towards specific populations and kind of a, mm. a system. So I guess, Kevin, you're sort of saying like the child allowance is targeted. Are you thinking about it that way? Like because it's families with kids? I mean, I think it's much less. I, I think it's more universal than a lot of other programs, but it's still right. it's somewhat targeted in that. Right. In that sense. OK, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in UBI as a, as a broader frame. I haven't sort of conceivably figured out how you do it. So, you know, one thing I will say as a policy scholar is I think when you really change social, when you really change like the fabric of society, you want like a, a really, really, really good reason to do it. And UBI would really it would require that, right? So any sort of tallying up of, um, of, of how much it would cost gets me to $3 trillion, maybe 2.5 trillion. So you're talking about like doubling the federal budget. And um, to me, I'm, I'm not ready to go that far, right? But um, I do think, um, I do care more about kids and families with kids than I guess, other folks. And so that, um, you know, I think some people might say I sort of then slip into that deserving versus undeserving poor sort of frame. But um, I think there's sort of this clear sort of, sort of societal reason to invest in kids just with like all of the you know, stuff we've heard about sort of the long term investments. And then I also think it's a matter of like, we can do this, we can do child allowance for uh, $90 billion a year. And if it goes really well, I think that opens the door to thinking about like, okay, how do we, how do we universalize this a little bit more? And, um, but on some levels, I also sort of feel, you know, like when we introduced the child allowance, when I wrote $2 a day, UBI was like nowhere on the political terrain, right? We didn't even mention it in our, our book. And I was like, uh, then I started learning about child allowance. I was like, oh, this is great. And then I started talking about it. And everybody's like, oh, this crackpot liberal, you know, professor is spending all the money. And then somewhere between like starting to talk about it and when like the paper actually came out, it actually became kind of like the, you know, it's almost like the moderate idea now, you know. So that also, I think, is, is an interesting testament to me of like how far the thinking of some group of people, I'm not even sure who it is. Although, you know, UBI, I would say, both of these, 
one of the really interesting things to me about UBI and child allowance is the same political fault lines uh, don't appear, right? So, you know, I'm thinking of Bob Greenstein. He's a guy I um, admire a lot. He ran the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. He thinks this is a terrible idea. And, and frankly, they've been like trying to shoot it in the foot um, for a while because like he really is like, we're never going to spend that kind of money. And, you know, you, you want to use the money you have on the very poor. So we got to do means testing, right? And so he's worried about that. Um, whereas, you know, I um, have a good friend at the Cato Institute, um, whose name I'm blanking on right now, who really likes the idea, right? So I'm like, gosh, I, I never expected to like, be having this easy like yeah don't we we all agree on this you know with um uh, my colleague at the cato institute and like bob greenstein is like adamantly opposed so i i do think that like there's something there which is useful i think in terms of like figuring out how we're going to do this okay professor delahunt you get the last question yeah I, I don't think i don't know if we could answer it in, in a couple minutes um but thank you it's good to uh, see you yeah, it's good to see you too. Thank you for yeah. your talk. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, what you said, congratulations also in, in terms of getting, you know, so much support. And I wanted, I wanted to find out if you had reflected on, um, you know, in, in proposing policy, if you've reflected on ways in which you can get support from different, you know, you talked about uh, having the same end goal, but different motivations. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've reflected on a way to to think about policies that we are uh, proposing, because it is so tough to um, <laughs> to actually have them go move forward. Yeah, yeah. I so I've been thinking a lot about that, and I don't know. Are you on a? Are you on a? Um, I'm on a trip, walking dinner. Oh, walking that's trip. awesome. <laughs> that's great. Had a lot of sugar today. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I I got a Fitbit, and I all um I go on a lot of walks with my dog and I do my meetings so everyone knows about my dog barking at stuff so that's uh, I'm all uh, I'm all for it um, I uh, I think this is really interesting fodder right in trying to figure out like one thing I think is a reflection like figuring out about us right and how much like how important is why we think we should do things versus the actual policies right and that's like that's a little tough to grapple with of um, do I, what is what I really want is somebody to like acknowledge this thing in society that I'm really upset about, or is what I really want is like get more money to people and, and like ferreting that out is just, I think there's like a reflective practice there of just sort of figuring out uh, what is matters because I also I do think policy should more often start with principles than, um, than like cost benefit. Uh, honestly, I think we people what people care about is principles and so we should be thoughtful about that but I think some of it is really understanding who the people are who you sort of you need and what makes them tick so I'll just end with one example where I got interested um, in dental care right and the lack of access to dental care and um, yeah I saw it in two dollars a day a lot when I'm meeting with families like Jennifer Hernandez just she um, she just her mouth she had like serious issues with her gums and you could see why the research suggests like that really inhibits her ability to get a service sector job for sure and so i got really interested into like mid-level dental practitioners and the idea that like we could we could train someone in a relatively short amount of time to do about 50 percent of what uh, dentists do actually generally on, on a day-to-day -day basis um and uh, so I got really interested in that. And uh, uh, it turns out dentists really, as a group, they really didn't like the idea. Um, actually, my first professional hate mail was from dentists. I don't know if there are any dentists in the, uh, the call, but uh, I've saved it. It was a big moment for me. Um, and, uh, but who really does like it is um, Mike Shirky, who is a very conservative you know, head of the Michigan State Senate. And he, after some advocates really took the issue on. So I sort of saw my roles like we convened an event at Michigan. I took a lot of the fire. I was like trying to create a like a pilot program. And then some advocates were like, you know what? We think there's enough support here. We're just going to do it. And and they got Mike Shirk to their credit. He became the champion. So at the same time, I was writing like op-ed after op-ed about why that guy um, 
you know, shouldn't put work requirements on Medicaid, I was like cheering him on writing op-eds about why dental therapy is a good idea. So that's like what I call one of these crossover issues. Auto insurance was another example of that, right? When we, I think sometimes when we stop and listen, we can get out of like our, um, our own sort of heads about how we perceive the world and be like, oh yeah, uh, I can see why auto insurance, you know, at 20% of your income is crazy. And we could do something about it. And like one of our sort of closest partners with that was the Mackinac Center, which is a, a libertarian think tank here in Michigan. So I guess like trying to change the lens on our issues like 90 degrees sometimes and have it not be about what we think is compelling about the policy, but really taking the time to, to think about what they think is compelling. And, and I think one place where like lots of people are like, you have to show like the cost effective part of that. And I've never actually found that to be true. I've never gone into like a Republican legislator's office and been like, we, you know, in the long run, we save money on this. I just don't think they buy it. You know, in the case with Mike Shirky, like the idea of a mid-level provider was useful um, because he doesn't like government that sort of inhibits, you know, red tape of government and he sort of sees occupational licensures as a piece of that. So if somebody can do the work with two years of training, what the heck, right? Um, I shouldn't get in their way. And to me, actually, I can get behind that too, because I'm like, you know, a lot of people who don't have money, they they don't get that training, right? They don't become dentists because they can't afford it. And what if what if they only had to go to school for two years? Like maybe, maybe that would open up opportunities. So I guess those are my only party thoughts is like turn the lens, figure out what really makes them tick and see. Um, yeah, Cindy Bank is here on the line. Maybe she should do a whole uh, event on this. But um, uh, those are some of my reflections. Thanks to everyone. I really enjoyed every question. Um, thanks so much, um, Professor Schaefer. This was really, really interesting. Can we all um, take a moment to acknowledge him, please, either like with your little hand symbol or you can show your video for a second. Yay. And, and we all need to go for a walk and follow Tawana's lead. So. That's right. <laughs> thanks very much for your time. I hope you all will join us in January. Our talk then will be um, led by Linda Tizar from LSA's uh, Department of Economics.